people die all the time, right? How many people do you think died today in Australia? 70,000? 1,000? 700 Do I have any other bids? I think it's, it's much lower than that. Of course, it changes over time depending on the population, right? But last year, um, it was 144 people who died each day. It's not that many, right? <laughs> Before you had 70,000. Yeah, she wants the whole lot done and gone. It may not seem like many until, of course, it's, it's someone you love. And then it's one too many, right? Or until it's you. And then it just, the whole thing just feels very unreasonable, right? 144. Why can't we just have 143? <laughs> and so this is why, this is why um, Atisha, that, that teacher, he said, death is certain. Life is uncertain. Death is certain. One day, we will be that number. We will be one of that number who has died. We will. Right? Maybe, maybe it won't be today, but eventually our day must come because death is certain. Life is uncertain. And so that means every day you wake up, like life is uncertain. Is today the day? You don't know. Could go either way, right? And one day, death will come. And this is information that we need to understand for several reasons. I'll go in, into those reasons a bit more later. Anyway, the second thing that Atisha, Venerable Acharya Atisha, Atisha, Atisha said was that your human life your human lifespan is continuously decreasing. Even in the few hours that we've been together here today, you have been inching closer and closer and closer to your death. Right? We are moving inexorably one way. It only goes one way. Can't go backwards. It only goes one way. And let's face it, I'm looking at the group and I'm thinking it's all downhill from here, people. <laughs> it's all downhill from here. Our lifespan is decreasing. Our lifespan is decreasing. And our life expectancy is uncertain. Our life expectancy is uncertain. This is what Atisha said. We're moving closer towards death and our life expectancy is uncertain. So my father, he's um, 70 something, 74 maybe now, and he truly believes that he will live to like the national average life span for a white male, you know? He truly believes it, you know, like his, his, his life's kind of measured out like this, you know, like, I think, what is it, 80, 88 or something? 82. 82, yeah. And so he's kind of like, oh, you know, 
I've got a few good years left in me yet. And it's kind of like everything is around this idea that he will just clock out at the average time like everyone else, right? Isn't that how we live our life? Like even, you know, putting away all that superannuation, doing all that stuff, it, it just shows just how um, strong this idea is of a natural lifespan, whatever that is, right? You know, and, and that means that, you know, living without having some sort of unfortunate incident, um, like a, an accident or an unfortunate illness, like a cancer and things like that. However, my father has had now several bouts of different cancers. And this really kind of troubled him, of course, right? You know, it's serious, serious sickness. But part of this, this um, difficulty to adjust to this new information was that very strong idea that he should have this much time to live, that he shouldn't have gotten sick, that this was somehow unfair because it was interrupting, I guess, that law of averages, right? But actually this is what those averages are made up of. Of course there's people who will live to 82, but to get to that average, you're going to have a lot of other people dying much sooner. You're going to have a lot of other people dying later. You can't decide. You don't get the same amount of time as anyone else. You die at the time you die and your life expectancy is uncertain. It's uncertain. It could be today. It could be tomorrow. It could be next week. For all the people who die today, tomorrow or next week, none of them probably are expecting to go, let alone wanting to go. And so this idea that we should have a certain amount of time it gets in the way of reality. Reality is going to the graveyard, going to Rookwood Necropolis in Sydney, looking at the gravestones, seeing the ages that people died. And there is no rhyme or reason to it. People dying at 47. People dying at 52, people dying at 14, 98, people dying at 2, people dying at 2 months, 2 days. And this is life expectancy, this is lifespan, this is what happens when you're born. It's a lottery, right? You don't get to decide how long you live. There's other forces at play. You might have an idea of how long you'd like to live, how, how, how long you'd, you'd like to be around. And I, it's okay, we're not expecting you to kind of stop your super annuation repayments or whatever, you're all kind of you're not going to sell your home and like, I might not be here tomorrow, the Dante said that. <laughs> we, we still have to live, right? But we live with wisdom, knowing you know, that any time, any time, this could be it. And this is useful not only for our own lives, but also for those around us. Because they too, they're not on our agenda. They can't stick around as long as we wish they would. And this is when we see people grieving sometimes, there is this refusal to accept reality. That, that person has gone. There's a woman I met 
in Malaysia last year, I get a bit sad thinking about it, she was, she was grieving, very painful, painful grieving. Her husband had been dead a year. They'd been together since they were in high school. She was in her 70s. And she, she, she was so angry. She was so angry. She was like, I just keep on thinking he should be here. And it's so unfair. He should be here. And she was really upset about it. And this is what grief is, right? This refusal to accept reality. This refusal to accept that a change has occurred. That that person, they were there, and now they are not there. It's a simple change. Gone. Vanished. She couldn't, she couldn't get on board with it. She knew it, but she couldn't accept it. And I remember, you know, I kind of did the whole spiritual care thing as best as I could. And, and as I always do, I suggested that she should speak to a grief counsellor. And she's like, oh, yes, I've got one of those. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, you know, there's so many books about grief. She's like, I've read all the books. She's like, I know that he's dead. I know that this has happened. It's just I can't accept it. And so this is that real refusal to, I guess, learn, to grow, to develop wisdom about this change and how hard it was for her to accept this reality that he had gone and she was angry at him because she wanted to go first. <laughs> and so this is, this is what Atisha is pointing at when he says that our human life, our human lifespan is decreasing and our life expectancy is uncertain. And then he says that death will come whether we are ready or not. Whether we are ready or not. So all of you people, you're going to go home so smug today. <laughs> I'm ready for death. I'm ready. Come and get me. And so that's great. Yeah, your mind's prepared. But even if you were unprepared, death will still come for you. And also, don't think that by being prepared that you somehow get like advanced credit points or something in life, so you get a few extra years of life expectancy or anything like that. No, it doesn't mean anything except that you are more prepared to accept this truth, this change, this process than other people. But regardless of how you prepare for death, or how little you prepare for death. The truth is that death will come for you, whether you're ready or not. And this is, this is important. Some of you before were saying, like Jim, that you want to be awake and aware. But what if you're not? You've prepared for death. And then, let's say you, you've been, uh, what horrible things can we do? Run over by a truck. <laughs> Run over by a truck, right? And then, Washed. and then it's all. <laughs> it's not my choice, but. <laughs> I know, it's not my preferred method. <laughs> but, but right, like if, like if we prepare for a certain kind of death, and we're like, oh, the way I'll confront death is I'll be very mindful, I'll be in lotus posture, <laughs> I'll have my favourite um, chanting on the, on the CD player, and, and then we kind of get uh, hit by a truck. <laughs> so much for all our preparation, right? And... For a lot of us, uh, our death may come as a surprise, for example, in the form of a heart attack or uh, a stroke or something like that. 
It may be something that you're completely unprepared for. You just didn't see coming your way. And again, this is just how it's going to be. It's not a dress rehearsal, right? You don't get a second chance. And we can't predict how we're going to die, what manner of death it will be. So we're just going to have to accept the death that is coming, whether we prepared for it or not. And this is, this is going to be important for us in that moment. And you can't just struggle against death and say, listen, I'm meant to be aware and awake in lotus pose with my favourite chanting on. You're just going to have to go with it, I'm afraid. And this is that acceptance, right? That this is how things go. We don't get to have a say in these things. So there's a, there's a bit of a, you see in Atisha's teaching, this is you know, hundreds of years ago still, it's kind of dialing back our expectations, dialing back our views of how we would like things to be. And then Atisha says, there are many ways to die. Yeah? There are many ways to die. Many more ways to die than there are to stay alive. So one of my favourite things is to look at the Darwin Awards. Do you know what the Darwin Awards are? Yeah. Yes, Darwin Awards are people who have removed themselves from the gene pool <laughs> by dying in incredibly stupid ways. And it, sounds, it does sound really cruel and nasty, right, to kind of like um, make fun of, of these people who have died. But they've died often in quite spectacular ways. I remember one of the ones that kind of made me kind of go, wow, was a, a guy who was a, a drug manufacturer and he was manufacturing amphetamines and he would always be chewing gum because he wasn't really eating. So he had like some ascorbic acid, some vitamin C powder and he'd kind of put his chewing gum into the powder to kind of give it back some flavor and pop it back in his mouth and continue, I don't know, mixing drugs. I don't know if this is how he mixed drugs, but... <laughs> Mixing drugs like that. <laughs> then one day he made the mistake of putting his chewing gum into some of the chemicals that he was mixing, popped it in his mouth. That chemical he was mixing was explosive. <laughs> and the putting it in his mouth and the, the action of his teeth moving against it caused a little spark which blew his head off. <laughs> right? We, we shouldn't laugh about this stuff, right? This is this is pretty intense. And but when I read that, pardon? He orchestrated his own. He orchestrated, yeah, in a way, yeah, but unintentionally. And, you know, sometimes when you hear about how people have died, it's just in the most stupid and bizarre circumstances. You can't predict it, right? And so we don't know. We don't know how we're going to go. Hopefully not like that. But... There are so many ways to die. That's what I get from that story. That's what I get from those Darwin Awards. And there are some sutras um, from the Buddha who, who talks about this monk who's in a forest and he should think like this. And I think I've already mentioned some of them today, that you could get, um, you could stub your toe and fall and die. You could topple over a cliff. You could get bitten by a, a, a snake, a centipede, or another animal. You could get really bad wind and get food poisoning and die. You could get, get attacked by people. So this, this, this sutta, it's one of the death contemplation suttas, the Maranasati sutta, is designed to get you to think, hang on a second, I could die any moment by any means. And the purpose of this sutta is to get the, the monk at the end of the day to reflect upon the dangers involved in living and to ask himself, what, have I got any bad qualities that I've got to overcome? 
If I do, then I should really strive because, again, tomorrow anything could happen. I could stub my toe, fall over, go off a cliff, etc. And so at the end of the day, the Buddha encouraged us to do this practice before we go to sleep. Have I still got bad qualities in myself? Can I overcome them? Can I get rid of them? You know, tomorrow I could, I could be my last day and then that would be bad for my spiritual practice. I wouldn't be able to continue on this path. And so therefore, understanding that there's many ways to die, I should strive harder in my spiritual practice. So this is the point of these kinds of like, quite morbid thoughts, right? Uh, Tisha says that human beings, human bodies, are fragile. And so this is the truth, right? Like, not only are there many ways to die, our body, our body is not very robust. We can't survive a lot of things. Think about even something like childbirth. Relatively recently, it became much safer for women to, to uh, give childbirth, to have childbirth. Before, it was one of the most common ways to die. Things like bacteria, viruses, kill people. Even, you know, the COVID epidemic, pandemic. You know, we saw just how fragile this body is to things like a virus. Bacteria, if you get a bacterial infection, you could end up with um, things like gangrene and having uh, blood poisoning, all sorts of things like that. Um, this body is fragile, very fragile. Put it in water for a bit, underwater for a little while, can't breathe. Go up in a plane, lose pressure, very quickly, right? Very quickly you'll die. So this body is fragile. That's why we have to take care of it, right? Why we have to be careful with it. This is why people of our generation generally aren't going on roller coasters and uh, thrill-seeking activities, right? Because we're kind of like, actually, my body is even more fragile than it used to be. And I don't know if I'm willing to take the risk on that one. Whereas younger people who perhaps they haven't, they haven't uh, gotten used to the idea of a, a body that takes a long time to recover. You know, they're off skateboarding around skyscrapers and things like that. So yes, this body is fragile and there are many ways to die. And then Atisha says, at the end of our life, our material possessions are not going to help us. It doesn't matter how much money you have, it doesn't ha matter how much redwood china you have, or what kind of art collection you've got, whether you've got Chanel or Target in the wardrobe, it doesn't matter. Those things cannot help you. Even having a lot of money, having the best doctors, cannot save you. If it's your time to die, your money, your status, your possessions, your connections, it won't matter. It can't help you. And your Family and friends cannot help you at the time of death. You can't help them either. When it's time for you to go, you are alone. No one can help you. No one can save you from death because death is inevitable. Actually, you know, I've had conversations with Venerable Rinchen about this. 
how at the time of death, it's usually the families who are causing the most problem for the dying because they just won't let go. And I know that um, when I read about things like end of life care, sometimes people will have a do not revive, do not resuscitate thing. Did you know that sometimes it can be overridden by the next of kin? Oh, regularly. Regularly, yeah. Yeah. You know, and so they end up resuscitating these people and intubating them and giving them a very low level quality of life because it's the family who can't stand to see these people go. And the family who who want to kind of stay there and, and pull them back. And Venerable Rinchen, she was saying, you know, I just chase them out. <laughs> because it's the wrong energy. I was like, what do, you, what do you mean by that? And she said, well, they're going the other way. The dying are going that way. And the living are trying to pull them that way. And it's just a mismatch of energy, she said. And you see that sometimes in situations where people are, are, are reaching the end. The family are kind of reaching out and holding on. And the, the person who's trying to die is just trying to let go and uh, you know sometimes they'll say look can you just shut up and get out and try to die you know because this is what they know they know that no one can help them they know that the process has begun and it is a process dying in that way is a process and it's a very predictable process and people go through all these kind of markers. This is why the, the nursing staff can say, oh, she's got, you know, seven hours left, something like that, you know. And, um, and so it's a process, you know, that they've already started. And once that process has begun, you can't drag them back just because you love them, you know. And so family and friends, loved ones, cannot help you at the time of death. And the last reflection of Atisha is that at the time death comes, your body cannot prevent death. You cannot rely upon your body anymore. And you might think, well, that's obvious. I'm dying. This body this body is just a form that you've gotten used to in this lifetime. And our experience of our world is conditioned very much through having this body and the experience of this body. And our, our experience as beings goes beyond this body. This won't be the first body that we have lived in and more than likely it won't be the last. So in Buddhism we believe in rebirth and that we've had countless rebirths over time. And we'll continue to have countless rebirths unless we develop wisdom and knowledge that allows us to escape from this round of suffering. And it's called the round of suffering samsara because it's this endless journey that we've been on. Life after life after life with bodies that have failed us, with bodies that have gotten old, gotten sick and died over and over and over and over again. You can't rely upon a body. There's a, a beautiful 
Samyutta, a cha- uh, like a chapter in the Samyutta Nikaya, which is a collection of discourses, linked discourses by the Buddha. And it's called the Anamataka Samyutta. This is the Sutta of Unknowable Beginnings. Unknowable beginnings. This is, this is what the Buddha saw when he looked back at that moment of enlightenment, looked back, 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 as far as he could look back. He said there is life after life after life going back, 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 back to unknowable beginnings. He couldn't see just how far. You know, he kept looking and it was like impossible to see all the way back to a, a beginning point. And that this is, this is that, that, um, that process of samsara, life after life after life. And, and so in this Samyutta, these teachings in the Anamataka Sutta, Samyutta, the teachings on unknowable beginnings, the Buddha asks the monks these kind of questions like, which do you think is more, monks? The amount of um, water in the ocean or the amount of tears you have shed grieving for your loved ones? And the monks say, the amount of tears we've shed. And his Buddha's like, yes, very good, that's right. The amount of tears you have shed grieving over those you have lost is larger than all of the water in the oceans. And something similar, like, which do you think, monks, which is greater? The amount of blood you have shed being decapitated. It's quite specific, isn't it? (laughs) Or the amount of water in the oceans. And the monks are like, the amount of time of water decapitated. Very good. Which do you think is greater, monks? The amount of... Uh, that, sorry, the, the height of that large mountain, Mount Lepula, the large mountain over there, or the amount of bones you've had as a being born over and over. And of course, it's the amount of bones you've had. Right? And so this is, this is the, the, the bodies that we've inhabited, bodies that have bones, bodies that have blood, bodies that cry. And over and over again, we've had these bodies. And over and over again, our bodies have failed us. And over and over again, we've had to take new bodies and continue this endless journey through samsara. And so we can't rely upon a body. We're going to have to rely upon our wisdom and our mind, if we want to escape this round of suffering. And so that's why doing this kind of workshop, like coming face to face with these teachings, is not just a movement towards understanding the grim reality of this life, the fact that we must die, that beings around us must die. This is just a small picture. This is just a small understanding. And even if that's what you take away from this weekend, this, these workshops, that's great. You know? It's great to understand a little bit more about the truth of our experience as humans in this lifetime. But it's a very small picture learning compared to the potential <clears throat> for a big picture understanding about the true nature of our suffering. So if we think, you know, we've got a lot of suffering in this life, it's only because we've got a limited understanding of what suffering is. When the Buddha saw back, 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 back to the endless beginnings, unknown beginnings, what he saw was not just like a list of births, but he saw the suffering involved in each of those lives. And this is why when we think about the first noble truth of Buddhism, that there is suffering, it's not just the small-scale suffering like 
I have to work in an office or that the, there is tax or that um, my foot hurts. The truth of suffering is much, much, much larger than that. Our true predicament, wandering round and round and round of rebirths through samsara, suffering over and over and over again, getting old, sick, dying, grieving, losing loved ones, being separated from what we have, experiencing the results of our karma. This is what the Buddha was referring to when he referred to suffering. And so this is something that you might glimpse in your spiritual practice from time to time, this bigger picture perspective, which really elevates you, really transports you, really transforms your view, really takes, kicks you in the face a little bit and what's, maybe slaps gently in the face and makes you wake up. <coughs> and this is why the Buddha taught these incredibly profound truths. It would have been easy if he was just going to stick to the kind of very small scale suffering that we all experience and we all know. But he opened up our eyes to this bigger picture based on his knowledge of what he had experienced. And since that time, countless beings have understood his teachings for themselves. And so even if we're not completely convinced of rebirth or um, samsara or things like that, it's worth thinking about a bigger picture than just our own personal small-scale suffering. If, if only because it'll give us more compassion and love for other beings who are also going through the same things as us. So it's pretty good if that's what you get out of this weekend. I'm suffering. I've got a body, I get old age, I get sickness, I get death, I get separation, I get karma. Oh, other people too have old age, sickness and death. Actually, that's quite a lot of movement in your mind, you know, that you've actually started to understand. It's not personal, <laughs> you know. I was just thinking before, oh, I'm a bit sick, why me? <laughs> Like, well, other people get sick, right? You know, it's not personal. And the same when, when death comes to visit, you know, where, it comes, where the death comes to visit our family or our friends. You know, it's not personal. It's not done to upset us, to interrupt our life. And so even if we just get that understanding, oh, this is not personal to me, this is something that happens to all beings, this is quite a lot of spiritual growth as well, because we're such egocentric creatures. To have that bigger view is very profound. And then you can imagine the, the, the bigness of the kind of view that the Buddha had, the perspective that he had. You know, instead of having like an object very close to our face like this, where we see only this object, you know, he had this vast perspective. And it's a very different kind of perspective. And if you have that, then imagine how different you would live your life, how, how it would really fundamentally change the way you think and live. And this is why those, those things that are sometimes very difficult for Westerners to confront, such as rebirth, such as karma, you know, we want proof, evidence, we want you know, facts, we want, we want to understand exactly how it works. It's very tempting for us to just throw these teachings out, to say, oh, well, you know, rebirth, whatever, karma, whatever. But the fact remains that these were core fundamental teachings of the Buddha and that he included them at the very center of his teachings. And so I'm not here to convince you, it doesn't bother me if you believe this or not, but all I would say is, the Buddha thought these things were important for us to know about on the path to freedom and that they were integral to our ability to become enlightened and liberated beings. And so he included them for some reason. 
And it's up to us to see if we can understand why. So, it's probably enough idle chit chat. <laughs> Should we go through Atisha's nine contemplations again? Death is certain. Yes. Our lifespan is continually decreasing. I usually flip the third and fourth one, so I hope Atisha doesn't mind. There are many ways to die. Oh, I missed one. Thank you. Death will come whether you are ready or not. Our life expectancy is uncertain. There are many ways to die. This body is fragile. Our friends and family, sorry, our material possessions cannot help us at death. Our friends and family cannot help us at death. And our own body will give up at death. So these are some teachings by Venerable Atisha. <laughs> 